You're watching Young and Profiting Podcast on YouTube. Welcome to the show. I'm your host, Hala Taha, and on Young and Profiting Podcast, we investigate a new topic each week and interview some of the brightest minds in the world. Before we get started, hit the subscribe button and don't forget to click the bell icon to be notified every time we drop a new video. Hey, Marissa, welcome to Young and Profiting Podcast. Thank you. Thanks for having me today. Of course. So uh, thank you for being on the show. You are extremely inspiring. You worked in the corporate world at Google for 13 years. Then you had a short stint at Facebook for over a year, about a year and nine months. In your corporate positions, you attended every leadership conference for women being offered, but you were extremely disappointed with the advice you were given. You decided to start your own lecture series, which we'll get into in a bit, and that spread like wildfire and really set the foundation, I think, for the rest of your career. And after you left the corporate world, you released a book. It's called Lean Out, and it's changed the narrative for women in the business world. It's been featured on Yahoo, Forbes, Finance, uh, sorry, yeah, it's been featured on Forbes, Yahoo, Fox, and CNBC. So let's start off with a very, very basic question. There seems to be two competing philosophies when it comes to women in leadership and modern feminism. And that is lean in and lean out. And for those of you who are listening who don't know about Lean In, that was a very popular book. It came out in 2013. It was written by Sheryl Sandberg, who is the chief operating officer at Facebook. (coughs) Then in 2019, Marissa, you came out with Lean Out. And Sheryl is actually 10 years your senior. You guys went have a very similar background. You went to the same elementary school and middle school. You both worked at Google and Facebook. So on paper, you guys seem like twins. But in reality, you have a very different perspective. So tell us about your perspective on women leadership and what's the difference between the perspectives of lean in and lean out. I would, first of all, I'd love to, to agree that Cheryl and I look the same on paper, but we're, we did grow up in the same uh, neighborhood a few years apart and both worked at Google and Facebook. I think we represent very different types of women. I mean, um, not the least of which she's very well educated. <laughs> She went to Harvard and um, has all these really esteemed titles and uh, things about her background, whereas I don't have much of that at all, except a really voracious appetite for psychology and research and science. And I think that's how we sort of um, our different perspectives were born. So with that long winded introduction, I almost forgot the question, which was. It was it explain a little bit how it's different? Yeah, what's the difference between lean in and lean out? Yeah, so the crux of lean in is that the gender gap is caused by these cultural forces that keep women down. So that keep us constrained into these very narrow stereotypes and roles. So for example, you know, we are um, told to sit still and, and be quiet. And so because of that, as you know, kids and then over time, we start to internalize those messages of society and we mute our ambition as a result. So one of the key premises in her book is something she coins the um, leadership ambition gap, which means that part of the reason that only, you know, for example, 5% of Fortune 500 CEOs are women is because, you know, culture and society, you know, conspires to uh, keep us down and and reduce sort of our goals for ourselves and and not take leadership positions, et cetera. Lean out. The premise is that the gender gap really has nothing to do with women. So the core message in Lean In is that women need to change their behavior in order to close the gender gap and get more women in leadership roles. And in Lean Out, my um, premise is really that. It has nothing to do with women, that women are not broken or deficient, but the system in the corporate world is such that um, it rewards certain traits that men have, not because they are inherently better or superior, but that's the way the system is set up. So for example, it's a zero sum uh, game. By its nature, as a triangle where spots become more scarce, the higher you climb, it lends itself to people who love competition and are more adept at putting their needs ahead of others. And research shows that women, or men compared to women, work 
do better, perform better, and we're motivated by these zero-sum win-lose games, whereas women are more motivated and perform better in systems that are win-win and collaborative environments. But the system is set up as a zero-sum competition, so it's biased toward people that are motivated by those types of games. It has nothing to do with women itself. And there's a lot of different aspects where we differ, but that's really the gist of it. Mm. I think that's really interesting. You mentioned this kind of briefly that we blame stereotypes for women not getting into leadership positions. How does this differ from men? Because there's plenty of positions out there that men really don't get involved in, whether that's being a nurse or a a teacher is typically Mm -hmm. a woman's job. So how come we Mm -hmm. have all these stereotypes and we look at women like, hey, you guys are not in the C-suite, you're not on board positions, but for men, we don't don't really look at that the same way. What's your opinion on that? Well, I think that's a big problem, and I write about that in Lean Out, of course, because what you're saying is that reflects the value judgment in society of what roles are more valuable and where we should be measuring women's progress. So we measure women's progress in terms of CEOs, but not in anything, not in anything else, not in any professions that are really necessary for society and important, like you mentioned nursing and and teaching. But one thing I want to comment on in the beginning of your question was around sort of the stereotype issue. And one thing I talk a lot about in the book, a lot of lean in, and it's not just lean in, any sort of business books that are born of this sort of modern feminist discourse that has been spearheaded by Cheryl, but it's not just lean in. It's just that book really represents a whole category of the books that have dominated the past decade. But uh, essentially what it says in in, in lean in and others is that women are punished for being aggressive or assertive, whereas men are rewarded as such. And that's a big reason that more women don't get to the top. Mm -hmm. And one of the observations that I make in the book is something I've noticed in my career is that the bossy, more aggressive women were the ones getting promoted, where it was the ones like me who sort of, I guess, fit more in with your idea of a stereotypical woman in terms of being nurturing and compassionate and being sort of very relationship focused and, and not as sort of cutthroat and aggressive. We pe- women like me were the ones that struggled mm-hmm. <laughs> because if you think about it, if you have a set of adjectives that describe a stereotypical woman, which are you know communal and, and um, collaborative and kind and caring, whatever, and then you have the male version, which are more aggressive and desire for dominance and all that, what profile is more likely to get to the top of a large corporation? Mm-hmm. Well, the male profile the question I pose in the book is, you know, why is it OK to discriminate against the stereotypical female profile? But if we discriminate against a woman that violates it, it's a national crisis. And there's a lot of research that shows that traits like being agreeable, like that sort of more aligned with the female stereotype, are a liability in the, in the corporate world. And that's not because they're not valuable. They are incredibly valuable. Like I was just listening to your podcast with Chris Voss. I loved his book, um, Never Split the Difference. Mm-hmm. You know, he talks about being likable as important in negotiations and in life. And that's commensurate with the female stereotype. So then why don't we see more of that get to the top? Well, because the corporate world is a structure that is designed to surface those more aggressive traits. It's a zero sum game. It requires people to put their needs ahead of others. It's not a, it's not the real world where there's some sort of equal power dynamic. Like he mentioned the Starbucks cup. Like if the, you know, they weren't nice to her, the person, they put decaf in the cup. And, and I agree with that. I mean, I really subscribe to his philosophy, but it doesn't work in the corporate world because there's an uneven power dynamic and there's rules of the game that don't mirror rules of real life. Yeah. I actually was going to ask you about that whole likable thing that you just mentioned, that it's less likely that a woman will get promoted if she's likable versus if she's more, you know, stern and, and bossy. But it's funny because I see I see both. Like, you know, I recently had a situation. Yeah, men are punished too. Yeah, and, and also, but I also see women being punished for being too bossy. And so it's like kind of like, what are we mm-hmm. supposed to do? We're punished if we're likable. It's then a double co- bond. Yeah, how are we supposed to act? You know, why can't we just act like ourselves is, is what I always say. We can, and that's the problem, right? Is that's part of why I wrote this book was to like take a breather from all of the voices telling us who and we're supposed to be and that how we are as we are isn't good enough and that we have to change in some sort of way. And you're right, there's a double bind for women because if they act aggressive or assertive, they're punished for that. And if they act um, within type, they're punished for that as well. But the point I make in the book is that aggressive women are 
punished for acting out of type, but it doesn't make them any less likely to be promoted. So while it might, while it is true, and I am, I am agreeing that that's something that happens and it's not right and it's not the way it should be, but it's also not the cause of the gender gap because research shows that actually men are more penalized for acting out of type than women. So all this research in the book, terrible, I forgot the guy's name who did it, it's Tim something. But it basically shows that men who are act sort of more in line with the stereotypical female profile are punished more in terms of fewer promotions and less earning potential than women who act out of type. The gap between, and if you think of a stereotypical male, the gap in earnings and advancement between a man who acts in type and without a type is larger than the gap between a woman who acts in type and out of type. So it's not even a gender issue. It's a matter of what traits and characteristics lend themselves to winning this particular game. Yeah. And that's what I'm trying to point out in this book is that, you know, aggressive and bossy women certainly sort of suffer for violating a stereotype. And I'm not advocating that that should happen. It's not it's not anything that I think is good. Yeah. But that is not sort of the social issue that we should be addressing when it comes to equality and women at work. Yeah, it's such a unique perspective. Like I've really never heard anybody talk about like basically personality types and how it impacts the gender gap. So let's dig into this a little bit deeper. You talk about a personality test that you took at Google where there was these like fiery types and then earth green. Earth green. Yeah, earth green types, which and you- fiery red. Exactly. So so tell us about this personality test and also how somebody like you with a, a very feminine, stereotypical feminine personality can thrive at work. I'll tell you the story about what happened with the personality profile because there's some nuances to it that I think are important. So when I was at Google, we did this team building exercise at an offsite where, and a lot of people do this if you work at a big company, this is a popular thing, but you take this survey before the offsite where you fill out all the details about your personality, your likes, whatever. And then when we got to the conference room in Mountain View at Google's headquarters, we were handed these thick black books with the results. And they were like these stunningly accurate maps of our personalities. And on the inside of each cover was printed one of four colors to represent one of the four major personality types. So like you said, I was a green, which meant I have a strong drive to help people. I strive for harmony and I prioritize my relationships. And I make the joke in the book that this was like the hippie group. And <laughs> to underscore that point, they didn't just call it green, they call it earth green, you know, which is exactly the profile you want to project or the image you want to project in a room of corporate sales managers. But anyway, the opposite of green was red or they called fiery red. And reds are competitive, they strive for power and control and they prioritize results over greens like me who prioritize relationships. So the HR person running the exercise told us to get in groups by color. So I go over to the greens and as I'm seeing people around the room, this question just pops into my mind. I blurt out loud, what are the colors of our senior executive team? And the HR person like clearly knew the answer, did not want to share it, but everybody was now so curious and it turned out nine out of 10 were green. Just kidding, they were red. Um, <laughs> and, you know, it was a huge aha insight moment for me at that point because people in the room were kind of like, oh, that's not fair. We're only promoting, you know, reds. But I saw it very differently. I thought, well, greens like me who are motivated to build relationships, maybe we're not, maybe this is a motivation issue. Because if you're a green and motivated toward relationships, then management positions are not only unsatisfying, they can be uncomfortable because having authority over people in that capacity uh, compromises relationships because authority and relationships are in tension with each other. You dial one up, the other goes down. So for example, if you're on a team with a couple best friends for years and suddenly you're promoted to be their manager, let's say you flex that position, right? You're like, I'm the boss lady now. You're telling them what to do. Your relationship suffers. But if you do nothing and you're still acting like their best friend, then your authority is undermined. Mm -hmm. So for people like me who are really motivated and rewarded by relationships, these positions of authority are not something 
not only that we don't aspire toward, that we just don't enjoy. I was good at it. I'm good at being a manager. I just didn't want to be. And point being, it was to me a motivation issue. If you're a green, a management position, you know, people are only going to work for things that they actually want and they're not going to work hard for things that they don't. So if management is the reward for hard work, I mean, what, you're only rewarding the people that actually are motivated by positions of authority, which is a subset of the population. Yeah. It's the old adage about, you know, people who ascend to positions of large power are motivated to acquire larger and larger amounts of power on the way. So again, it goes back to this systems issue because the reward for hard work, I mean, money, once you get to a certain level becomes less and less um, the thing you're working for because it becomes incrementally less satisfying as it becomes a smaller percentage of your base. So what's left? Power. And people who are really motivated like reds toward position of power and control are going to work harder and get those positions more often than greens. Not because they're more qualified for it, not because they're competent, but because that's how, that's the system that's set up. And as we know from behavioral economics, cognitive, every discipline will tell you that structure drives behavior. So we can't really have any meaningful conversation about women at work or the gender gap without just talking about the structure that that makes that disproportion in the first place. And then, sorry, there's one other thing that I wanted to say, which mm -hmm. is the corporate hierarchy was designed a couple hundred years ago by men in the industrial age. It was the first time, you know, they needed to organize hundreds of workers around common business goals. So if you're a man setting up your organization and you're more motivated by competition, you set it up as a competition. It makes sense. It's their wor worldview. Mm -hmm. But that was also built for a time where the economy was large scale manufacturing and that needs like assembly lines and scaled production needs a top down order power chain of command. But we're in an information economy now and the entire world has changed. You need creativity and innovation, which don't thrive in a top-down power structure. It needs the opposite. But we're still using these legacy systems that were created a couple hundred years ago. Everything in the world has changed except these underlying structures. So um, that's really, really the um, very long-winded <laughs> answer to your your question. Yeah, well, well, thank you so much for explaining that. And so I think at the root of this all is how do we define success differently? Because not everybody is actually motivated by getting into positions of power. Like you said, we define power in a very male-dominated way. Um, w a lot of us uh, who work in corporate, there's really only one ladder to success, and that's getting to the c suite like that's what mm -hmm. everybody in corporate wants. I work at Disney streaming. That's what everybody wants, including myself. Mm -hmm. I, I consider myself probably to be one of those red fiery personalities mm -hmm. who's ultra competitive. But there's plenty of people who I work with who are super talented and who are leaders who do not want to manage people and who have opposite personalities of me. They're very creative. They contribute a lot, but they're never going to get to those leadership positions because it's just not their personality. They don't have it in them. So how do we then define success for those people? And is, is there a current, is it totally broken where there's, there's no hope for those people? They're just going to stay where they're at? Or like, mm -hmm. what do you suggest those people do? And how do we start to define success differently in your opinion? So one thing that you mentioned, which is an important element of this, which is a narrow definition of power, but there's also a, a, an equally a, a equally large problem here, which is our narrow definition of leader. Because if you read sort of management uh, texts uh, from the 50s, 60s, they don't, they, you don't see the word leader pop up all over the place. It's manager. Today, over the past 10 years or so, when we've had this industry of thought leadership pop up, we've now used the term leader and manager synonymously. When at, They're very, two very different things. There are fantastic managers who are also fantastic leaders, but there's also fantastic leaders who are not managers. You know, before the last 10 years, we've reserved the word leader for people like Martin Luther King, who didn't have a following because these people were wor worked for him and that he held power over their salary and livelihood, right? He was a leader because he painted a vision for the future that people wanted to follow. Mm -hmm. They weren't mm -hmm. forced to. So I think that when we talk about women, you know, not being in enough leadership positions, the problem is we, we think of that as management positions, right? So part of it is broadening our understanding of the term leader. Because if you say, you know, people have said to me, so are you saying women don't want to be leaders? 
No, that's not what I'm saying at all. I'm saying women, not it's not all women want to be managers. Those are two, those are two different things. So I do think that um, we're thinking too inside the lines of how it's always been done and what we've always, you know, done. We've always had this structure. How could we even conceive of anything different? Well, it's not that hard if you try and just sort of get outside of those lines. You can make people, for example, um, you know, I work very well with red type personalities. My my daughter is actually dyed in the wool red. <laughs> and actually, we work well together. Um, she reminds me of all the things I, I need to do. But anyway, <laughs> um, I work very well with that personality type because there is a yin yang, um, a complementary set of skills. So um, like Sheryl Sandberg and Mark Zuckerberg have said so many times publicly that their partnership, that the secret sauce to their great partnership is that they focus on what they're good at and they lead in this um, partnership fashion. So Cheryl's really good at uh, scaling and putting operations and systems into place for things that already exist. She did that at Google too, and she took over sort of the AdWords organization. Mark is very good at creating new things that don't exist. He's very into the strategy and the product side, and he has no interest in sort of the operational details, right? I always found it strange that, you know, they talk so publicly about how um, important this partnership is to their success without realizing no one else in the organization was allowed to do something similar because, you know, it, it, you can't partner with somebody that's good on the management side because they have the position of power. You can't work in sort of these complementary ways because being an individual contributor is seen as sort of a lower power position. But there's no reason you can't have parallel tracks um, and sort of retool the system. You really want to keep your top performers. They don't want to be managers. And, you know, and, and they do this all the time for engineering, which I, I make a footnote in the book about, but I don't highlight. It. And I think it's an important point. It's very well known that code people that are really good at coding and engineers don't want to be managers. Why? Because they love coding. They want to stay on the, you know, doing the actual work. And from a business standpoint, it makes sense not to put them all as managers because if they're great at coding, you want them to code. You don't want them, you know, those skills, if you're good at coder, it doesn't scale by managing a team. Mm -hmm. But that's true in all aspects of the business. So like you mentioned the creative stuff. I'm super creative. It's not just that I'm a green, I don't want to be a manager. I'm creative, which is, I don't think linked to any sort of color. I've never done the, the research on it, but it's an element that I think a lot of people relate to. I really like to dig into the project, do the work, you know, sort of managing other people and taking information from up top and giving it to people at the bottom. I mean, it's, it's soul crushing to me and other people really love it. So I was really good at storytelling at Google in terms of creating sales pitches and presenting all the time to the sales team. And when I was really successful at that, how was I rewarded with having to manage a team to stop doing the thing that I loved and what I was good at? So it was a loss for me and it was a loss for Google. So I think the structure we have now um, just it doesn't work. And I think to your point about being ourselves, we can only be ourselves as we're, you know, we're not putting these arbitrary value judgments on, you know, what's valuable and, and, and what's not. And I think that, um, you know, you can change the rules of the game and retool the system, but that takes a long time. And I don't think we need to wait for that to happen because you can also change, um, you can change rules of the game or you can change how you play it. And that's what I mean by defining success on your own terms, just because the corporation says this position means that you did well, you succeeded, you advanced, doesn't mean that that's how it has to be defined for you. Mm -hmm. You know, I think we get, it took me 15 years to realize I was working really hard for things that I didn't want. I was, instead of sort of figuring out what it is that I want and going after it, I was just sort of following a script of what I'm supposed to want, you know, the next promotion. And I'm looking around, well, this person didn't work nearly as hard as I did and they got promoted. So now I'm pissed and now, you know, I've got to fix it. I got to get to that position. Well, I didn't really want that position, but I really wasn't defining what it was I was aiming towards. So it was easy to just use what the system spit out as the goalpost. And that's part of the, the problem. So really the, one of the messages in Lean Out 
Because lean out doesn't mean quit your job or reduce your ambition. It just means leaning out of anyone else's story for what your, you know, who you should be, what your career should look like, and what success means. Um, so that's really what that piece of it is in terms of defining success on your own terms. Yeah, I love that. Thanks for, for breaking that down. So in your book, you say the system is broken. And you say it's because of how we pick winners and how we motivate people. So I think we gave a good you know, overview of both of those things just now. So like you said, it's up to us to define our own success criteria. But in terms of people who are in management positions, who are leading companies right now, how can they act differently and do things differently so that they aren't just picking those fiery red personalities for promotions? Yeah. And how can we actually make a change if we are leaders ourselves? That's a great question. And it goes back to this idea that women have dominated academia every year since 1982, right? So the question becomes, why doesn't that last after graduation in the work world? And the predominant theory is, you know, this culture thing. I think it's much simpler. I think in school, we have grades. We have objective ways to measure our work and our impact. And in work, at the, in the work world, we don't have grades. So instead of measuring people on the outcome of their work, we measure them on how they behave mm. um, on the way to that outcome. So I'll explain what I mean. You know, in the, in the office or on Zoom, whatever it is these days, um, in a knowledge economy, we're not producing widgets. We can't count like I made five, you made seven, you did more work than I did today. You know, a lot of times we're dealing with the ambiguous and invisible strategies that might not sort of take shape for a year. So in, this, in these environments where it's really hard to tell who's doing a good job or frankly, who's working at all, what happens is our brains default to whatever's most visible. We have a, a real bias for, for visibility. And so it becomes the people who we see the most, talk the most, talk the loudest, work on the most visible projects, self-promote you know, the most self-aggrandizing, the ones that, you know, desire, desire to dominance, they're dominating a meeting. These are the things we see. And so we um, start to use them as proxies for work and leadership and impact. And these visible behaviors, they do, they correlate more highly with men again, but they don't mm -hmm. correlate more highly with good performance or, or leadership. So the real answer is, a shift to really objective ways of measuring somebody's work for as a creative person. Again, one of my real strengths is being able to do something that takes someone who's very linear, maybe two weeks to do, and maybe it'll take me a couple hours. Look, there's a lot of things that they, you know, linear people do that I, you know, I wish in a million years I could, but that's one thing I do very well. But one thing I was penalized for at work, because then what am I doing for two weeks? It didn't matter if what I did was better. It was the fact that I wasn't visibly working on it as hard, right? And it's sort of the opposite of what we want to be rewarding at work. You don't want to be punishing people for being efficient and creative, but that's what, you know, ends up happening. So I think that there are, you know, we throw technology at everything in this world, but we don't throw technology on getting better at grading people on their performance. And another example I use in the book is in college, like my roommate and I took all the same classes, but she was very conscientious and went to all of them. And I was lazy and, you know, studied the night before and we got very similar grades. And I would, you know, use that as an example of like in school, that was okay because we both got a 94 doesn't matter how I got the 94 and it was a really big wake-up call at work suddenly I had to focus on how to present my work more than I ever worked so mm -hmm. really if you're a manager and I tell women, uh, anyone not just women the more you can get and there's companies doing this in really interesting ways like Bridgewater the hedge fund where they really try and make it more of a meritocracy using algorithms and technology but we don't all work at places like that one thing you can do is when you have performance conversations with your manager, ask them for very clear, tangible outcomes that they want for the quarter and discuss or the half and ask what would sort of what kind of measurement can we use to 
gauge how I'm doing against those goals and then use that as a foundation for every single performance com- conversation because what I found is if you don't have that a manager at the end of the quarter can sort of use any anecdote or false perception of you throughout the quarter to influence your score or your ability to get promoted so the more you can ground conversations and objective ways that you've impacted the business and you're consistent about them it might not be a panacea but it it at least it helps and uh, that's sort of um until we get better with on the technology piece i think that's one way to address it on a day-to-day basis yeah for sure let's talk about COVID a little bit because it's obviously changed the way that we work we all work from uh, anybody who's a knowledge worker is pretty much working from home i haven't been in the office at disney since march you know we're all working from home and i found that everything is more results oriented now. Now I know that you're not working in a corporate situation now, so you might not have a complete opinion on this, but I've noticed that it's less about, you know, having to be like stuck at your desk anymore because they can't, they have no power over that anymore. They can't see us anymore. They only see the results that we have. So um, do you have any opinion on how COVID has shaped our system, good or bad, uh, when it comes to the gender gap and when it just comes to how we uh, judge productivity and things like that? Well, do you guys use video conference at Disney? Both. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, again, like you said, I can't speak to this from personal experience, but I do speak to, you know, th- over the past uh, six months, I've talked to thousands of people in my virtual talks and, you know, friends of mine that are still at Google and work wherever. I have heard similar things to what you're saying, but the majority of people I speak to actually tell me the opposite, which is they're finding they're working longer hours um, than they were in the office. And that because people, and, and this might be a kudos to Disney, because if you guys do have your uh, setup in a way that does focus on results, you're way ahead of, of most people, um, because in a lot of companies, there's still sort of not that objective way to say at the end of the quarter, you know, I pulled in this much in sales or whatever it is. And it's even harder when there's no face to face opportunity to drop by the boss's desk and sort of, you know, make yourself heard for five minutes. Um, so people feel more of an obligation to be on video, show their face, email more because there is no other way Mm -hmm. you know your your boss doesn't sort of see you leaving for a client meeting you know and and see you in a a conference room presenting and or in on the team meeting so actually what i've been saying and and you know this is interesting feedback that you know i need to sort of um consider a little bit because i've been speaking on the opposite uh, scenario which is it's it's increased the pressure and it's increased the amount of work but not increase the amount of productive work mm-hmm. um, and and it's increased the amount of uh, publicity kind of kind of work um, so what and I think work expands to fill the containers in so far as how long people are working mm-hmm. um, you know and so now we're home the can- containers bigger so people are expecting people when there are no objective results like grades then who's ever more motivated to be seen as the good one sets the new benchmark for which everyone else on the team now has to compete with. So I, mm-hmm. I see it as the same issues manifesting in a different environment. Um, but clearly there's pockets that it's great news that yeah, are working I- in the opposite way. And it could be a fact of my personality that I'm very good at making my work very visible and I'm very good at videos. And so I can shoot a video and use my podcasting skills to Mm -hmm. kind of stand out where maybe other people aren't having a tougher time. Maybe it's just easier for me. Um, Okay. So let's talk about your time at Google when you started this women's lecture series. Because I think this is really cool um, that you started this sort of, not side hustle, it was like an entrepreneur within the company, then you took it out and you started doing speaking series at other companies. So how did this come to fruition? Why did you do it? And t- talk to us about that journey because I'm sure there's lots of people out there who wants to want to start speaking and want to start their own thing. 
I started, okay, so I have really have always been fascinated. My, I've done so much reading and research because I'm interested in it and sort of gender and psychology and evolutionary biology. And, you know, then I got into a whole thing on business books and behavioral economics. I, I don't know. I'm all over the place. But over 15 <laughs> years, I did a ton of reading. I've always just been sort of very interested in, in, in gender. And excuse me, I've I did a lot of writing before college and in college and then not again until I started writing this book, except I, I did write a ton of email. But apart from that, um, there <laughs> was always everybody. sort of, right, exactly. But I think there was this creative person inside that just was trapped for a long time. And when, it, toward the end of my career at Google, I just started feeling like, um, I don't know how to describe it, but I felt, I, and, and it's funny because my role at the time that I started this was the best one I'd ever been. I was so happy. I loved it. Maybe that's what it was. I was also on stage a lot presenting to salespeople all the time, and I sort of had this aha of like, oh my gosh, I love being on stage, and I love writing and then performing my writing, which was really what I was doing at Google. Um, and I'm quite introverted, actually, so you wouldn't think. I hated speaking up on meetings, but get me on a stage, and I was like, total ham. So it kind of made me sort of wake up a little bit, like, oh, I love doing this, but I don't love doing it about online video advertising, which is what I, you know, <laughs> I was doing it for in my job. And I, like you said in the beginning, I was attending all these women's workshops because after Lean In was published, Google went all in on like female leadership programs, all this stuff. And, you know, having always been passionate about that, I was like, uh, you know, sign me up. But over time, I became so disenchanted because it was so, it seemed just, it started out with great intention. And I think that it was good at first, but it morphed into this beast where, you know, women in the most high positions of the company would get up and lecture us and then everybody wanted to sort of get involved because it was good for their career and we couldn't really be honest about what was going on and sometimes on stage would be like a woman I worked for who hated women more than anyone else I've ever worked with and she's telling us about female empowerment so it just felt phony <laughs> and it angered me because this was something I cared very much about I'm also a single mom of three kids so I have very tangible real challenges that I felt like I wasn't even allowed to talk about so mm -hmm. I just got more angry is what it was I you know what as I, I I'm sort of thinking of my answer as I'm talking and now I, I'm getting to it. It was, I just got angry. It was so phony and I hate phoniness and it, phony about a topic super important to me. And so that really was what inspired me to write my own perspective. And then because in parallel, I had been doing these trainings at, at, at Google and it was the first time in my career, I really got to write my own stuff and present it. I started to see how much I loved it. So I think the anger combined with, you know, sort of discovering a little bit of, of what I liked, um, I just felt compelled in a way I can't describe. And it didn't really take off at all like wildfire because at first it was a, you know, five of my friends in a conference room that I, you know, made made them sit there while I presented this thing I had. But then over time, more women started to show up and I started going out looking for other opportunities to present this. It was very fulfilling to me. Mm -hmm. um, and when I went to Facebook, mm -hmm. there was um, a, par a big part of me that thought, oh, this is the perfect place to expand this platform. Because in my mind, I thought, you know, I'll do this for 10 years on the side and then maybe start my own thing. Facebook's a great way to accelerate that program, you know, birthplace of Lean In. And they came mm -hmm. to me as, you know, they tried to recruit me for something totally unrelated. But in the recruiting process, I asked a million times, I really feel passionate about this project. Would I be able to continue working on it? Would you, and ever? Oh, of course. This is Facebook. Of course, we're gonna. You know, blah blah blah. That did not go <laughs> as planned at Facebook at all. It was a horrible experience. I write about it. You know, in the book, the prologue. Mm -hmm. You can also find it on Medium on my Medium page. Uh, why working at Facebook inspired me to write Lean Out, um, and. It was terrible. And I met Sheryl Sandberg my second week. And 
there was a part of me that thought, oh, this is a shortcut. She'll love, she'll, we'll meet each other. She'll love that I'm doing all this stuff. She'll give me the, she'll give me the platform I need. Like I had all these crazy fantasies about what was going to happen and actually led to my demise, but um, figuratively speaking, but at Facebook, again, I was in such a horrible place mentally, emotionally, that I sort of returned to work on this series as a life raft, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, and at some point, I was at a women's thing at Facebook, and this, I just, the, the anger returned, and I thought, you know what, instead of getting self-righteous about all of this, I need to take myself seriously and share my truth and tell my story and share, you know, what I think and feel. And um, that's really what gave birth to the real commitment to turning that lecture series um, into a book. And now I'm speaking Mm -hmm. on it full time. It's amazing. It's amazing how passion you had 10, you know, years or so ago has led to your ultimate, you know, goal now. And same thing with me. I started Young and Profiting Podcast as a side hustle in 2018. Now I own a podcast marketing agency. We're doing so well. And it's like, you know, two and a half years in and I'm ready to, you know, hopefully become a full time entrepreneur as well. So it is possible to have a side hustle and turn it into your full time thing. Um, it's not you easy, mentioned- though, I will say. It's not it's, easy. You have to be really hardworking. <laughs> when I started at Facebook, decided to turn it into a book, and I was still working there, I mean, I would wake up at 4.30 every morning and work on it for an hour before I got the kids up to go to school and off to my job at Facebook. And it took me, I had to change my my whole personality, basically, to become disciplined. And I think once the... Um, once things in my life got bad enough, like finally I was able to take the thing I needed to seriously. So I just, I do want to say it's very, you can turn it side, but it requires like, um, a lot. Yeah, it does. It requires sacrifice, you know, and, uh, organizing your time in a different way. And you're not going to have enough, you know, the same amount of time for your relationships and things like Mm -hmm. that. Um, so it's, but also it's really that it's, you can choosing. do it in small steps. I think people get overwhelmed by the idea. Oh, yeah. And I think that's what stops people. But if you start like you did dabbling in something you really enjoy, like I did, mm-hmm. then, mm-hmm. you know, it could eventually turn into something over time. Completely. My first when I first launched my podcast, I was launching a podcast every three months and then it became, you know, every month mm-hmm. Then it was every week. Then, you know, it just kept escalating and I got a team and processes and, and that's mm-hmm. that's how you scale. So I completely agree i want to dig deep into your time at facebook because you like kind of skimmed over it um uh just really quick are are you able to go like five minutes over or do you have a hard stop no i can go five minutes over okay cool let me just Um, check but i'm pretty sure yeah yeah let me just plug in my computer actually while we're taking this little break yeah i'm good you're good okay Mm -hmm. so i could go like if i needed to not that I, i don't think we will but in case okay yeah um Okay, so I want to dig deep on something that you mentioned previously. You mentioned your time at Facebook, and you hinted to the fact that um, it was a very different culture from, you know, your time at Google. And, you know, you told them about your little side hustle project that you had um, in advance of working there, and then you had some backlash when you actually started working there. Um, Like I said, Heather Monahan is one of my mentors, so I listened to your interview with her, and you guys were talking about how they made you take down a blog post that had like four views on it um, because it it was something that they didn't agree with. So tell us that story. What did you do when that happens? And how can somebody who has a side hustle advocate for themselves when they are not like, you know, when they are doing something that's totally legal, it's non-competitive, it's none of the corporation's business, in fact. So what did you do? And uh, tell us a story and, and how others can learn from it. Yeah, it was crazy. So I worked at, so I grew up at Google, my career, like I grew up in my career at Google. I started off right after grad school and was there from the time, you know, I was 23, 24 up through whatever. So it's a very weird company to grow up in because it's Google. And I was sort of, you, you know, you start to think, that's how, well, I, I knew that's not how all companies operated, but I thought that's how all tech companies were. And that Facebook would be the same as Google. Mm-hmm. And Google had its its issues. I'm not saying, you know, they were, you know, it was like utopia, but 
they were, you know, when I was there, I think maybe they're different now, I don't know, but they were tolerant of um, conflicting mess or internal debate or open debate. And as long as it was respectful, you know, dissenting views, they actually have changed since then. But anyway, that's how I grew up, so to speak. And so, you know, I was speaking when I was at Google, I would speak, you know, I was at Pace and New School and doing all these. Nobody cared at all. Like you could write a blog post critical of Google. And as long as you were, you know, sort of sharing confidential information or whatever, they just didn't care. It was not that way at all, Facebook, and I was really surprised. They're very strict about everything to do with messaging. So even in the sales realm, there were these very strict um, ways that you had to talk about the product and your presentations, and um, they were very controlling over that. Um, mm. And I wrote, so like, for example, I spoke totally separately from Facebook at a uh, medical conference on it and I spoke on innovation and I had to get my deck approved even though it had nothing to do you know it was just that kind of thing it was new mm -hmm. so then when I was going through this hard time I just started writing for the first time and you know since college and I posted a couple articles on my my new brand new medium blog which like you said it like literally it didn't have all it had was my name it didn't link to any social media it was just my little sandbox and when i would write something i would send it to my best friend and my parents and that was it and it never mentioned facebook or google you had no idea who i was from writing this and i wrote one about self-deception and then my other post was about how innovation gets stifled in large companies because you know um innovation is uh, compromised by big egos, okay? Mm. No one had ever seen this article except my parents. I don't even think Sarah, my best friend, read it, okay? It was boring. And then one day, I got this email from corporate comms at Facebook to tell me to take it down. And I was like, I, I was floored because I couldn't even figure out how they found it, right? Like mm. how, this isn't something I shared with anyone and it wasn't connect, it was like its own island. So then a friend of mine who worked for HR, ran, she ran HR for a big bank, explained to me that they use these software th packages to find any place in the internet where some employee that or a person that has the name of your employee has posted something. So I guess that's what happened. And they read it and asked me to take it down. Um, I was shocked because, like I said, it's still up there on my Medium page. It's like the second article I ever wrote. I mean, now it's all connected to my social. But back then, I mean, no, not at did all. Did you take it down or did you say no? I, I said if I changed it to my initials instead of my full name, are you okay with that? And then she came back and said, I think at first took it down. And then I was just so pissed. I went back and asked later on. She said it was fine if it was just my initials. So it just had my initials. My name wasn't anywhere on it. And then first thing I did after Facebook was put my name on that sucker. <laughs> yeah, I'm surprised. I'm like the most popular person at Disney streaming on LinkedIn. I'm so surprised that they aren't like at me like all the time ask, asking me to take things down or reviewing my stuff before I post it. At first they were, you know, even though I disclosed that, cause I already had Young and Profiting before I started there, I disclosed it. And at first they were giving me some issues and like the legal team kept contacting me. Um, and then now they just, they kind of just let me do whatever I want. So it's, it's kind of nice. That's um, great. Yeah, and Google would have been exact. Google was encouraging of that stuff, but it speaks to the culture at Facebook. And I also think that there's it's really, you know, if you think about Sheryl Sandberg's uh, narrative on women, she spent a year on a campaign to ban people from using the word bossy. There is an intent to control language. And I think that that's reflected in the women's um, stuff and also um in the in the company itself there is a a a mission to control everything about what people say mm. 
So let's get into another story uh, about your Facebook time. So when you were initially recruited, there was a woman who basically, you know, recruited you to join the company. She gave you so many compliments. She made you feel really welcome and like you were going to be a great fit. And then you got to the company and she ended up bullying you so much for so much so that somebody else reported it and you had to like take a course on, you know, bullying and whatever. So tell us about that story and also, you know, what are some of the lessons that you learned from that? Yeah. So the, I, I got a call from quote, her name, the, I refer to her as Kimberly in the book. She's a senior executive at Facebook and she called me, um, in March of 2015 about a role at Facebook. She wanted to recruit me for one of her directors is someone I'd worked with closely at Google. So he was recommending me and I wasn't ready to leave Google. I was pretty happy at Google at the time. But Kimberly is like one of the, she's just super over the top charming, like knows exactly what to say to make you feel like she gets me. She was like super, um, she's very flat, it was a lot of flattery. And this went back on for many months. I mean, it was really a courtship. And over maybe, I don't know, nine or 10 months of this back and forth, not every day, but like we spoke and we became friends and um, she finally won me over. And then mm-hmm. um, my third week at Facebook, she just totally turned on me um, in a way that was so dizzying and confusing. And, um, you know, she she wouldn't acknowledge my existence in public. She wouldn't reply to any of my emails. She undermined me or made jabs all the time. It was like I had no idea what the hell was happening to me or why. Mm-hmm. Um, it was horrible and I eventually found out that it was uh, so she used to work at Google too but I and I knew her but we had never worked together so there Mm -hmm. in several different ways I found out that there were other people that she had done this to in the past who I had connected essentially she was pissed about my meeting with Cheryl and saw it as some oh I, I didn't give that context so I reached out to Cheryl my first week there to see if she would um, have a second for a quick introduction a hello the next week it, she was speaking at our sales conference in San Francisco my second week at Facebook so I just sent her an email saying like you know oh I'm from North Miami Beach like nobody in tech is from North Miami Beach so it was like a hometown girl kind of thing like mm-hmm. you know I'd love to just shake your hand and meet you in person real quick but she ended up giving me 20 minutes on her calendar we, we met for about half an hour at the conference just the two of us so I was like oh my god this is amazing like you know Charles Sandberg's gonna be my best friend and like this is you know all these stupid fantasies but Kimberly saw this as because she didn't she wasn't there in the meeting she doesn't really know me that she saw it as like a political maneuver you know because here she has mm. been courting this relationship with Charles Sandberg for three years trying to like spread her feathers you know like a peacock and here I am my second week I go and so I could see from that perspective if you're that type of person why you might ascribe those intentions to me but it's laughable if you actually know me I'm like horrible at politics so um anyway she just was pissed and wanted to do everything she could to not only get rid of me, but humiliate me and like drag me through the mud in the process. Um, and so someone else reported it, but we had to go through an HR investigation, um, which was a nightmare. I had no choice but to participate. Of course, she was found, you know, innocent. And then next thing I know, I'm on a <laughs> pick, a personal improvement plan um, where, you know, they say you're going to be fired if you don't Im- improve. Number one, I didn't want to participate in the investigation. And I was told that there's a very strong anti-retaliation policy that if I do participate, I won't be punished. So that investigation ends and like a month later, I'm on a pip. I'm like, what is going on here? So, um, you know, of course I say something to the new HR person who didn't know about the investigation. I'm like, isn't this protected? Suddenly I'm like off the pip, right? It's very clear cut legal thing that they Mm -hmm. did. But I knew eventually I'd be fired. Um, It was impossible to 
to do my job. And by the way, one of the, I still have the the performance improvement plan document in my drawer. And sometimes I go back and laugh because it like the biggest reason for it was my failure to develop good relationships with Kimberly and her team. Um, <laughs> so it was just a really, really horrible experience. I went from this job I loved at Google where I had this great reputation and I was like loved by the sales team and I was really well respected and I had this great setup where I had flexibility you know it's like an old timer I've been there forever like I, and yeah. then at Facebook I was like a freaking pariah with leprosy I, it was just terrible um mm. and you start to really question like who am I what am I doing and that's really what forced me into being honest with myself about me and who I am and that that world was never going to be a place I could fully, you know, uh, m yeah. manifest, I guess, my talents and potential. Yeah. So there's there's two questions that I want to ask you. So one is, why is it that women are so competitive and nasty to other women in the corporate world? Like, so let me start with that first. And then the second question I have for you is, why did you wait till you were fired at Facebook? Why didn't you just quit? Um, I'll answer the second question first, which is I'm a single mom of three kids and financially independent and I don't get money from anyone. So to basically say, screw you, Facebook, I'm going to do this book was just trust me. I wanted to quit. And every week I do my budget and see, but it just felt completely irresponsible um, mm. you know, I, I have a house and a household and kids and I live in an, a, you know, nice neighborhood with good schools. I mean, that's just wasn't even an option. Um, mm. so what I did was work on the book, knowing I was going to be fired to maintain, to get the salary and the stock and everything I could so that when I was fired, I could use that as my money to take a bet on myself because it requires a lot of money to do something like what I did. And mm -hmm. I based this, that was my plan, save up as much as I can so that I could live on that money while I try and forge this new path. Um, yeah. So that's a very easy question to answer. The first question was, I think that women can be very nasty to each other because and competitive because work is a competition. Corporate world is a zero sum game. And I think that um, the vast majority of women when, you know, being out of that world now and, and, and having met tons of more women outside the corporate world, you know, when women are working together toward a common goal, their relationships are their power and their currency. And when you put women in a zero sum competitive scenario, it erodes the very fabric of their relationships and it erodes the very thing that makes so many of us strong. So I think that women aggress toward other women in ways that are covert and underhanded and seem nasty. And men mm -hmm. aggress for other men in more direct overt ways and we almost expect it of them. So I think that the corporate and, and, and men don't sort of use relationship at their relationships as um, like emotional weapons like women do, because women uh, connect to other women through relationships and these sort of like really deep connections. And then when you're competing again, it's very easy for women to you turn around and then it's not easy for women. It's easy for women that are really competitive and trying to get ahead to then flip the script and turn that against other women. But I yeah. think that women in environments like I read about all these women all over the world that are dealing with like um, these severe economic issues and these women in these villages and communities come together and like change that their corner of the world for themselves in these amazing ways so i don't think it's that women are comp like always mean and competitive to each other to each other i think they're like that when they're working in a world that requires them to do that in order to succeed yeah it's kind of like that's the only way to get to the top anyway so you might as you might as yeah. well have that like crab in a bucket mentality i guess because you're not going to get rewarded for anything else uh, exactly yeah. Okay. So you left Facebook. 
and then you came out with this book. Were you worried that you were going to get backlash for this book? And did you get backlash? And did anybody reach out to you like Sheryl Sandberg? And like, what happened? Did, did people retaliate against you? I think, no. I think that, first of all, the thing I was worried about most was that I was afraid, honest to God, that Kimberly was going to hire a hitman to kill me. And I went around <laughs> to tell, I went to my family and friends. I was like, if I die under mysterious circumstances in the next few years, you must investigate her. Like, it's her, I'm telling you. And part of that was because I was reading a, this amazing book called The Sociopath Next Door by Martha Stout at the time and it was a great book but not necessarily the great book to read when you're outing a sociopath you know publicly <laughs> so that was really my biggest fear um I still sometimes get afraid when I watch like movies or whatever I'm like oh shit is she really gonna kill me but anyway that was what I was afraid of I wasn't afraid of um backlash I don't know why I wasn't I probably should have been but I wasn't because if you read the book you under you it's hard to get I don't know I think it's hard to get angry because I'm trying to be very fair and objective and take different people's perspectives and show why we're not making progress on this issue and the faulty logic I don't think I'm dragging anybody through the mud as a person you know that is so um and you know I only talk about lean in in the first chapter or maybe this a little bit in the second after that I don't even talk although I do take down other books but um I think that maybe my I haven't received backlash because I think that maybe my intention came through really loud and clear, which is my intention is to help women. And if Shell Sandberg and I have different ways of doing that, then that shouldn't be controversial if our goal is the same. Right. It's only controversial if somebody has a vested interest in their way being the right way. But if both yeah. of us care about because I do think that lean in is helpful for a lot of women. I, I loved it when I first read it because I was in a place of I was in, uncertain about my career. I didn't know why I was wasn't getting ahead. And she had all these answers for me, which just was, were easy, mm -hmm. but ultimately weren't right. And I was sort of, I think, hoodwinked by it. So I do think that women that aspire to be, you know, CEO of a corporation, this is probably a very useful book because you're looking at experiences from somebody who's been where you're trying to go. My issue with it is women are not some big monolithic brain where we all want the same things and want to get to the same places. And it became this like, if you don't agree with lean in, you're anti-woman, which is ridiculous. So I do think it mm. does help. But I, I wrote this because I never saw anyone like me with my challenges, my voice that I could connect with talk about any of the real challenges we all were facing so i didn't get backlash i never heard from cheryl because she's got much bigger things going on like you know <laughs> she's at the senate like on the senate floor every other day and she's never mentioned lean out partly i'm sure because she's smart and knows that if she said anything or acknowledged it that it exists it would be the best thing that ever happened to me because you know people are still finding out about my book they all everyone knows cheryl sandberg so like even if she went out there and was yeah. like Marissa Orr is the worst and, you know, that's why we fired her and lean out sucks. I would be like, yes, like finally people have heard <laughs> my name and they know about my book. So, um, no, I haven't heard from her. I'm still crossing my fingers that I do. So, yeah, that's that's the story. That's so funny. Maybe I'll have Cheryl on my show and then mention it. And then maybe I have both of us at the same time. I still option. harbor I'll these. Just, yeah, I'll ping you in. <laughs> I'll ping you in randomly. Yeah. I still I'm think scared. we would be good friends if we if she I harbor these. Like I'm like, you know what? If she knew me, we still would be really good friends because we're allowed to disagree. <laughs> um, very cool. So the last question I ask all my guests is where can our sorry. So the last question I ask all my guests is, what is your secret to profiting in life? This could be financially or professionally. It could be anything. My secret to profiting in life is self-awareness, I guess. Um, being honest, honest with myself. My whole thing in life is to stay true to who I am and figuring out what that even means. Cool. And where can our listeners go to learn more about you and everything that you do? You can 
find me and listen to a much better answer to that question when I'm more articulate on my podcast, which is nice girls don't watch The Bachelor. And just a heads up, actually... I'm a big loyal fan of The Bachelor Nation. That's supposed to be irreverent and a joke. My middle name is B-E-T-H, so at Marissa Beth Orr. On Medium, it's just at Marissa Orr. And then I'm also on LinkedIn. Very cool. So we'll put all her links in our show notes. Thank you, Marissa. This was such a great conversation. I loved it. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks for listening to Young and Profiting Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider leaving a review on Apple Podcasts or comment on YouTube, SoundCloud, or your favorite platform. Reviews make all the hard work worth it. They're the ultimate thank you to me and the Yap team. The other way to support us is by word of mouth. Share this podcast with a friend or family member who may find it valuable. Follow Yap on Instagram at Young and Profiting and check us out at youngandprofiting.com. You can find me on Instagram at Yap with Hala or LinkedIn. Just search for my name, Hala Taha. Until next time, this is Hala signing off.